The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody. Welcome to Yaron Brook Show. We are back. Long time since we did one of these news roundups, uh, but we're back today, all of next week. We should be uh, we should be back on schedule at least until the end of July, where I travel again. But uh, that trip, I expect to do some shows, so uh, we should be relatively normal through the summer. Uh, all right, let's see. We have a, a lot to talk about. Let me just say there was a lot of breaking news, interesting news, very positive news in some regards. Um, on the Supreme Court front, I'm not going to cover that today. Uh, what I'm going to do is get an expert to come in and, and talk about this court, talk about the, the, the last uh, court term, talk about some of those cases, and, uh, and give you a, a layout of all of them. So we'll do one of the longer shows on the Supreme Court and cover the cases from last week uh, that we would have covered in the news roundup uh, generally, but that I think that, 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 is, good, uh, that is good anyway. Um, last week, uh, the, this last week, as you know, I was at Ocon. Ocon was amazing. Uh, it was really, really good. So, um, uh, yeah, thank you for all of you who participated. I hope you had a great time. I think you did. It looked like you did. It seemed like you did. Um, but, uh, yeah, lots of people from the radio show, like, I don't know, half of the conference was like, you're on book show fans. So, it was, uh, it was really terrific, and it was really, really fun, and uh, I hope all of you come next year. I mean, there's no excuses, right? Next year is in uh, California. The weather will be better than in, uh, than in Florida, and uh, it'll be another, I'm sure, uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, conference. So a lot of you were there for the first time. I hope this, it was the first time of many, many, many more conferences. Uh, in the years to come. So, uh, yeah, start thinking about uh, Anaheim uh, next year. Bring the kids and uh, take them to Disneyland. Disneyland will be literally in walking distance from, um, uh, from, the, uh, from the hotel. Uh, there's no humidity in California, so that won't be um, uh, a problem. It was one of the biggest conferences we've had, certainly on the East Coast. I think it's probably the largest we've ever had in the East Coast. West Coast conferences tend to be larger. And uh, there were almost 500 people there, or about 500 people there. So uh, it, it, was, uh, it was really fantastic. And uh, I expect next year, I'm pretty sure next year, will be quite a bit bigger than that, given that it's in California. All right, let's jump in. Uh, ben & Jerry, Ben & Jerry Ice Cream. Uh, you know, Ben & Jerry Ice Cream, they're owned by Unilever, the European uh, company that owns a lot of different brands. You probably don't know Unilever, but you know a lot of the brands that they own, food and other household items and, and so on. They're, they're massive, a little bit like Procter & Gamble uh, is in the sense of the diverse um, uh, products that they sell. Well, Ben & Jerry uh, is the ice cream out of Vermont, and I don't know how many of you know, but Ben & Jerry have been uh, committed hippies, leftists, for way back, way back. Um, uh, we're, talking about, um, we're talking about the 1990s, I remember Ben & Jerry. Ben & Jerry were way leftist back then. They're still way leftist, uh, and, but, and on the 4th of July, they did what Ben and Jerry do. Not, nothing here surprises. They, they wrote, the 4th of July, it's, uh, this 4th of July, it's high time we recognize that the U.S. exists on stolen indigenous land and commit to returning it. Learn more and take action now, and they give you a link to uh, a Ben and Jerry website that basically uh, articulates the story of the different indigenous uh, people, and they particularly highlight the Mount Rushmore, uh, where we've got the, the, the statues of four presidents, and they say, you know, this belonged to the, to, to the, to the uh, you know, Tunka Sali, Skapi, whatever, the six grandfathers, uh, Sioux Nation, and we should be returning it to them. Uh, so they are, they are generally 
Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, you know, I, I saw some posts saying, hey, Ben and Jerry, are you, are you returning some of your stores that are on, on uh, uh, so-called native land or, or the factory in Vermont, which is on so-called native land? Um, you, you know, so they, they make a big deal out of the back hills and about, uh, and they, they, you know, they keep, so the whole story is really about uh, Mount Rushmore. But generally, give back the land, give back the land. Um, and of course, Wayne Media went up a plectic and um, they've announced a boycott of Ben and Jerry and uh, Unilever stock as of this morning is down significantly, which I don't, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it, but it's down significantly because this is, uh, as, as the right-wing media has defined it, this is Ben and Jerry's Bud Light moment. This is Bud Light and we're going to see now Ben and Jerry sales tank, and we're going to see uh, we're going to see Unilever stock tank, and so on. And I actually don't think so. Um, I think this is way overplayed in terms of the stock price and even the boycott of Ben and Jerry. The reality is, and and it tells you a lot about the right. I think the reality is I've been boycotting Ben and Jerry literally. I mean, they have delicious ice cream. I've been boycotting Ben and Jerry since the mid 1990s. They were crazy leftist socialists advocating for horrible policies. They would regularly be interviewed on TV. They were CEOs, and therefore they got some prestige from that, and therefore people took them seriously. And I said, I'm not giving these bastards money because, because they're advocating for philosophy and ideology that I oppose, and this is the brand. The brand is affiliated, associated with the left, the worst elements within the left. And then if you if you uh, and then when they sold to Unilever, I said, "Ooh, maybe now I can buy uh, Ben and Jerry ice cream." But then Unilever basically uh, established uh, a, a special board for Ben and Jerry to maintain their kind of corporate culture and to maintain their advocacy and their their continued uh, you know leftist agenda and policy. So I basically have not eaten Ben and Jerry since um, uh, since the mid nineteen nineties. And yes, their ice cream, I think, does taste good, although I don't eat ice cream anymore. Anyway, it, it's probably way too sweet for me, but, but yeah, I'm sure at the time, it was definitely a, a good-tasting ice cream. But you know what? There are lots of good-tasting ice creams. There's no shortage in great ice cream in America. You don't have to buy Ben & Jerry. And everybody's known they are crazy leftists from way back, from... from you know, decades ago, 90s, right? 30 years ago. So what did they say here? They set a standard leftist line about indigenous people and about their land and we stole their land. All right. Um, is this going to, is, is this change my assessment on Ben and Jerry? No. I mean, this is no different than anything else they've said in the past. They, they hate capitalism, they hate Israel, they hate everything. They, 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 they are they're, they're very woke, they're pro-woke, they've always been politically correct, when politically correct was the term. So, yeah, and they said on 4th of July, which is par for the course for them. I mean, they used to come on television in the 90s a lot, just slamming markets and capitalism and, and, uh, and CEO pay and... Uh, everything about corporations. So my view is they've always been left. If somebody pe suddenly people have woken up because it was the Fourth of July. Give me a break. So I, that's why I don't think I don't think this is uh, going to be the issue. Now, if, if Ben and Jerry had said something pro trans or pro LGBTQ plus, which I'm sure they hold, they have those views, and made a big deal out of it, then I think the boycott would hold because I think the boycott is primarily driven not by these crazy leftists, not even by woke stuff. I think it's really driven by LGBTQ. That's why the successful ones are being uh, Bud Light and Target because of their LGBTQ stuff, which I thought was pretty lame. Here's a company. Here's, a, here's how lame the right is. Here's a company that has dedicated all of its energy towards radical, leftist, crazy ideas for 30 years. 
And the right's like, blah, who cares? Oh, now, now they suddenly wake up, but I don't think it's going to have any impact. Yeah, they have had rainbow flair, flavors, the huge pride and everything, but their whole corporate shtick is crazy left from the beginning. And the right has ignored them, basically. Nobody's boycotted them. I'm, I'm sure all these TV hosts, they all eat Ben & Jerry ice cream because it tastes good. But... One little thing that Bud Light does with, with uh, uh, Mulvaney or whatever his name is, uh, a trans person or, or, or Target adding some stuff, it is so, so, so obviously LGBTQ is freaking the right out. And it's a leverage point, And it is their thing. And um, that's why I don't think this will have an impact because this is too generic left. This is too, they've always been like this. And again, I've been boycotting because I do believe in boycotting companies that, are, that, that commit their profits to a social ideology. I mean, an extensive social ideology that, that I'm opposed. I, I wouldn't be boycotting Bud, Bud Light other than the beer sucks. And, and I, I don't boycott Target because I, the corporation is not dedicated to ideology, dedicated to an ideology I, I'm opposed to. Ben and Jerry's whole... All their profits, or a significant portion of the profits, are dedicated to promoting ideology that I oppose from beginning to end. And um, I boycotted them, and I think you should too, and I think everybody should. I don't think this is going to have as much oomph on the right as uh, targeted and Bud Light because it, it doesn't have that trigger. The trigger is what? LGBTQ issues. It, it's, it's the same. If you watch my talk at Ocon... It's, it's what Putin knows, right? Putin knows that the right in America is obsessed by this issue. So in every single speech, he talks about the decadent right. How is the decadent because of gays and because of LGBTQ stuff? And, and, and to a large extent, the American right supports Putin because, hey, he's on our side on, on the most important issue of the day, most important issue in the world today, which is LGBTQ. And because of that, because I, I, I should have ordered the topics differently. So, so because that is, um, uh, because I, I, you know, we, we, we talked about that. Let's, let's put DeSantis, let's get DeSantis, we'll skip him ahead a little bit. Um, so anyway, that's Ben and Jerry. Um, DeSantis, uh, I don't know, a, a couple of days ago put out an ad. You probably saw this. Uh, I don't know if you saw the video. I highly recommend watching the video to, to really get a, uh, a good sense of, uh, of what this is, uh, um, you know, what, this, what, the, what the uproar was. <laughs> so he put out a video ad. I guess uh, his pack put out a video ad. And the video ad basically is making the case that Trump is pro-LGBTQ+. Indeed, Trump says in this video, oh, that he would add a, a, a trans to his uh, beauty contest, that he didn't care where Kate Lynn, which bathroom Caitlyn Jenner used at the White House, and, and a bunch of stuff like that, right? So the idea is Trump is, has embraced uh, uh, Pride Month, he's embraced the LGBTQ uh, community. I, on the other hand, Ron DeSantis, are tough on them. I am. Super tough on them. And if you watch the video, it's spooky. The imagery is spooky. It's weird. It is... Uh, so, so it starts off okay with Trump saying these things related to LGBTQ. But then it, when it tries to focus on DeSantis, uh, it's, it's got DeSantis, like, it's very dramatic. It's got, he's got lightning coming out of his eyes. Um, you know, he's got these big tough-sounding uh, laws that he's passed. He is going to clamp on of them. He is going to crush them. He is going to destroy them. And then you've got images of men, real men, men's men, you know, not to be mistaken. You know, none of those guys, God forbid, are LBGTQ. So you've got DeSantis, of course, in a uniform with his, uh, with his military uniform on. They've got Christian Bale, an image of Christian Bale, a man's man. It's just they 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 got it a little wrong. I think maybe they intended this, but it's it the image is from American Psycho, 
where he plays a serial killer. They've got Brad Pitt as Achilles. And then they've got an image of, of, of the lead character in Peaky Blinders, one of my recommended shows on gangsters. But the guy's a gangster. Kills people. He, he actually, uh, the Peaky Blinders specialize in actually cutting people's eyes out and, and, and uh, making, them, making them blind. Um, these are the images. And everybody, all the other guys are guys, guys. This is a campaign ad. DeSantis is a nut. I mean, he really is. I, I was hopeful. I was hopeful. Anything but Trump. But this guy's dangerous. He, he is a complete nut. He's got all in on woke. He's got all in of this is the only issue that matters. He doesn't talk about anything else. Um, he, you know, he, 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 he's defended this video. And he, he says uh, uh, the video is there to identify tr Donald Trump as really being a pioneer in injecting gender ideology into the mainstream. Um, he was having men compete against women in his beauty pageant. <laughs> I mean, what chance did men have in winning the beauty pageant if they competed against men? Bring him on. It's not like sports. Here they clearly have a disadvantage, clearly massive disadvantage. I mean, God. So, um, LGBTQ has turned into the only issue that seems to matter to Republicans right now. They're fighting over who's tougher about it. Donald Trump, of course, on the campaign trail, is no longer uh, uh, pro or sympathetic or moderate around LGBTQ. He's all in on bashing them, attacking them. They are the big problem. Uh, they are the big problem. Um, um, you know, uh, they are, uh, anyway, so <laughs> LGBTQ, that's it. That's all they, these people care about. So that is the big, uh, the big issue on the right. And, uh, I guess they're willing to, to die on that issue because I do think they'll die on that issue. I, I do not think that's an issue that will wins them the presidency or wins them, uh, s significant votes in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in states that could go either way. I, I, I don't think senators and congressmen, are, are, you know, this enhances them. I think this weakens the Republican Party uh, significantly. But um, that is Ron DeSantis for you, the LGBTQ warrior. That is how he has uh, presented himself. All right, one consequence of affirmative action going away is that universities now have to figure out how to admit students. They can't use a, a race as a qualifier. They can't use it to keep out Asians, which is the primary thing they used it for. Uh, and uh, they now have to find an alternative. Now, you could, you could assume that the alternative would be something like, I don't know, merit, test scores, quality of essay. Uh, but uh, there is now a push to, um, uh, to use a new tool a powerful new tool to, to uh, you know, to take in uh, new students and, and to guarantee that there is, uh, there is, I guess, some form of diversity among uh, those students coming in uh, into, uh, into our universities. Uh, this is a, 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 new, a new guidelines that has been pioneered by the medical school at University of California, Davis. Shocking that it, this is in California. And the new tool is, just in case you weren't sure on how, you know, the, the significance and power and influence of altruism in our culture, the new tool is called, called the adversity score. So students will be scored based on how much adversity they faced. And the head of admissions, um, he says, uh, look, mostly rich kids get to go to medical school. I want kids to face adversity. I wonder if rich kids can face adversity and if rich kids who face adversity count or is it only adversity faced by poor kids? Um, so um, they say the disadvantaged scale has helped turn UC Davis, this is from a New York Times article, into one of the most diverse medical schools in the country. Uh, and this is a consequence of the fact that in 1996, um, California banned affirmative action. So they used diversity <coughs> and 
adversity scores to replace affirmative action. So now, uh, the more you suffer, uh, the, the more you can show that you're poor or you struggle or whatever, the more likely you are to get into med school. Um, if I ever go to a doctor's office and I say a diploma on the wall that says you got a degree at UC Davis, I am leaving. I am walking out. I do not want a surgeon to cut me open or a doctor to advise me who got into medical school because of adversity. And who knows, maybe the grades they get are based on their adversity. I don't know. I, I, there's no guarantee of that. So uh, uh, this is really spooky. Really spooky. And uh, it, it truly, is, uh, truly is scary, right? Um, I, Darren says, why are you in favor of the rainbow cult? I'm not. I just think the right is nuts about it. That's all. I, I'm not in favor of, uh, of the, the subjectivism. I'm not in favor of the nuttiness. I'm not in favor of the, the nihilism expressed by many in the LGBTQ community and by some of the kind of behavior in pride, of, pride events. But I also think the right has gone crazy over this. And I'm just pointing that out. You can be against, you can be against uh, some of the uh, some of the nuttiness of the LGBTQ community without endorsing the bigotry of Ron DeSantis, uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, call it what you want to call it, the complete insanity and panic, real panic, moral panic of, uh, of uh, Matt Walsh and uh, what's the other guy, the, the, the 1220 guy, and, uh, and Ron DeSantis. You, you know, the, you could hold two things at the same time. These guys are bad and these guys are crazy for freaking out. Um, anyway, 20 schools have recently requested more information about the adversity score, sc uh, score um, and uh, about to implement it. So uh, you are now going to have people graduating from college, admitting into college at, at least, and maybe graded in college. I, I, I don't know. Now based on their ability, and, and the scariest one is medical school, right? The scariest one is, is, is medical school. You, you, we now have to research uh, who goes to medical school and how they're graded so that we know, right, um, and, um, you know, all based on how much you suffered. Now, I, adversity could be a factor. Overcoming adversity is certainly a, a, a strong, uh, a, you know, manifestation of a of, of certain character. And uh, it, it's, not, it's not bad to be uh, somebody who overcomes adversity, and that could be a plus, and certainly should be and can be a factor in making a decision, I mean, uh, uh, but hopefully, uh, test scores, ability, commitment, uh, uh, grades, uh, you know, some other measures of first intelligence and second, just commitment to the field, uh, you know, an ability, ab ability to communicate. There are lots of things that you need in order to be a good doctor. And uh, those are super, super important. Add to that, some factor for adversity, fine. I don't have a problem with that if it's focused on the character building, the individual. Right. Censorship, maybe the most important story, um, the most important story of the week uh, was that a judge in the, you know, there's a lawsuit going on um, uh, from uh, several uh, state attorney generals. Again, the Biden administration claiming the Biden administration violated the First Amendment by putting pressure on um, by putting pressure on um, uh, social media uh, in terms of what was being said in social media uh, on, on uh, social media in terms of uh, in terms of the the content that was being presented and so on uh, the 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 Twitter files helped expose this but this was filed well before the Twitter files and and this is something we all knew was going on I mean uh, social media. Like Zuckerberg admitted that this was going on. Everybody knew this was going on. Indeed, Twitter files revealed very little that was surprising and new. Um, I always said it was censorship, but censorship of the government, not censorship of Twitter. Twitter didn't censor. The government censored Twitter. The violation here is the government vis-a-vis -vis Twitter, not Twitter vis-a-vis -vis you. 
So, uh, and I always said that, blame the government. When everybody went after Twitter, when everybody gave, went after Facebook, I said, don't go after them. They're the victims. So, I'm right again. Anyway, the judge orders the Biden officials to limit contact with social media companies. So, judges ruled... It's not Owen Boyle. You don't understand the character of Owen Boyle, and you have, no, you have no understanding of the character of Owen Boyle if you think these people are Owen Boyles, or if you think uh, that, uh, that it's, it's, it's an equivalent case. You, you just don't understand um, what Owen Boyle was, and you don't understand what Twitter and Facebook were actually doing. Anyway, um, a judge has just ruled that uh, the Biden administration policing social media likely, he hasn't ruled that it violated, likely violated the First Amendment. Uh, and, you know, so he's putting an injunction on the ability of Biden officials to, to um, contact social media and to be in touch with social media. Uh, this is already manifesting itself in, um, like, the State Department has canceled the Facebook meeting because they're looking for guidance, they, 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 they're worried about this. This is a Louisiana federal court. Um, uh, you know, the, the story, of course, is a Louisiana federal court orders upending efforts to guard against 2024 election interference, as if, as if that is the issue. Um, and again, they say likely. So um, let's see what happens. Uh, I hope that this ruling holds. Um, if, if there's election interference, I have no problem with election interference. It's your responsibility as a consumer to figure out, uh, you know, what's, what's good or bad for you, what's right or wrong for you. Uh, it's, it's not an issue uh, for the government to, to decide these things for us. Uh, we need to decide it. We need to be aware that election interference is going on, and it is. There's no question that the Russians, uh, and to some extent the Chinese, but the Russians are just much better at this, interfered in, um, um, oh God, uh, interfered in the uh, 2016 and 2020 elections uh, to varying levels of uh, success or lack of uh, success. Um, let's see how this goes. All right, it seems to be working again. So the government has no business in meeting with social media. They can provide social media with information. Uh, I don't know about, about uh, intelligence information, about known hacker fan or known uh, misinformation farms that are coming out of China or coming out of Russia, but they need to leave it alone other than that. They have no business, no business, telling social media what to include and what to not include. Um, and, and, uh, and, it, and as long as that is the idea, as long as this is really about censorship, by the government, as long as the idea is the separation of government from social media. And that should always be, always be the case, right? Should always be the case, separation of government from social media, separation of government from the internet more broadly. The government's only job on the internet is to protect it from, you know, foreign hackers, from, from, from people doing criminal activity from overseas. So uh, this is good. We'll keep following uh, this story. Uh, and, and see how it develops. I wouldn't be surprised if this case goes to the Supreme Court. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think it's going to be a, uh, a, an important, super important uh, decision with regard, to, uh, with regard to protection of free speech in the future. And the protection, by the way, of the social media companies' free speech. Not, right? They're the ones whose rights are violated. Not me, not you. Social media their rights were violated because they should be able to decide what, whether to accept what you say or not accept what you say at their discretion, not at the government's. So it's not about what uh, uh, social media did to you. It's about what's, what the government did to social media. And if that's the focus, uh, this could be a, a really, really important ruling ultimately. All right. Uh, finally, uh, quickly on France, uh, we got riots in France that have been Horrific. I mean, uh, you know, again, uh, poor people burning down their own neighborhoods is kind of sad to see. Uh, but these riots have been horrific. Uh, I think it's six, seven days in a row. Uh, and uh, all, uh, all as a consequence of the fact that 
uh, uh, police uh, killed a 17-year-old um, who, uh, I guess, uh, was refusing to stop and seemed to be escaping a scene, and they shot at him and killed him. And um, now we've got, you know, we've got massive, uh, massive riots there, primarily by by North Africans, primarily by the Muslims, in the outer wing of of, uh, of Paris, Marseille, and other places. And one of the one of the things uh, to note here is that this is, I think, to a large extent, a consequence of the the, the ongoing frustration within these communities or the ongoing failure within these communities to integrate them into French society. Uh, these neighborhoods are neighborhoods that the French police won't even go into, where crimes are committed and the French police do nothing, where people call the police and the police don't come. You want anarchy? You believe in a so-called pretend anarcho-capitalism? These neighborhoods have anarchy. And as a consequence, people are afraid to leave their homes. The gangs run them. There is violence everywhere. It is horrific, and people are super frustrated and super ups upset. Uh, so the no-go zones, same thing as Sweden. When you have no-go zones, when you refuse to bring the rule of law to certain communities, you are guaranteeing more crime. You are guaranteeing more lawlessness. You're guaranteeing you know, more violence. And, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the failure of the French police, the French government, to bring the rule of law to these neighborhoods. They want immigrants. Come over. But then they stick them in these neighborhoods and they... They pretend they don't exist, and they let violent gangs and Islamist terrorists control these neighborhoods. So, um, I don't think... Uh, uh, now, this is not growing pains of immigration. To the contrary. You don't see this in the United States. Because the United States doesn't allow for no-go zones. It's not that ethnic, ethnic groups don't cluster. They do. But in the United States, we apply the law everywhere. Or at least try to. Or aspire to. And ultimately, ultimately, we expect people to assimilate. Not, we don't do it as well as we used to. And yeah, when the Italians came, we had a mafia. And when the Irish came, we had the Irish mafia. I didn't and get that. Jews came, Could you try again? Mafia. So violence, unfortunately, is associated to some extent with immigration. But all of that could be dealt with, was limited in scope, because we didn't just ignore it. We fought it. Unless the fence start bringing the rule of law into these neighbors, same thing in Sweden, they will only have more and more and more trouble and more and more and more violence. So uh, it's worth watching, seeing how this develops, seeing how this evolves. Uh, but it's tragic. It's tragic for everybody. It's tragic for, for the innocent French bystanders. It's tragic for the people in these neighborhoods who are not actually, via, you know, who, 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 who are not part of these gangs or not participating in it. They're destroying their own neighborhoods. It, it, but it's tragic also for, for the young kids there who don't have a life because, uh, you know, the French authorities have completely abandoned them to the gangs. All right, we have a ton of Sorry, chat questions. Sorry, I'm still not a sure about that. We'll see, uh, you know, I'll try to go over all of them. Th these are supposed to be my short programs. This is going to be a long one. We've also raised money uh, more closer to the 650 a goal, so uh, let's institutionalize that. We're only $100 short of the 650 goal, so we've blown through the $250 goal, so thank you to everybody. All right, let's start with $200 questions, one by James. Uh, James says, thank you for all, you, all your hard work and insight. I look forward to becoming a monthly supporter. It appears more bankruptcies now for businesses than 2020. Therefore, how do small businesses compete with big businesses with government support? Also sending a new finance video. Um, 
So yes, I mean uh, the uh, uh, this is a, this is going to be it already is, and it's going to be a very difficult period for businesses, and it's going to be a difficult period for small businesses and mid-sized businesses more so than large businesses that the government always seems to come in and bail out. Although there is also it's going to be. If there's a recession, it. it's gonna it's gonna hit big businesses as well. Sorry, I'm still um, not sure it, about that. You know, whether we go into recession or we just enter this period, which I think we've already entered or entered 15 years ago, of just permanent stagnation or slow economic growth, um, I think I think it's horrible and it's very difficult for small businesses. Regulations generally hurt small businesses, and um, and what do you call it? Uh, um, and support. Why is Siri going off? I didn't hear Siri. Where's Siri? Siri is disrupting the show. Where? I don't have Siri. Is huh? Still, you can still hear Siri. I don't even. I'm not even wearing my watch. It's not on my. Oh, there she is. Okay, there's Siri. Sorry, I'm still not go sure away. about that. Siri, go away. All right. I don't, well, I don't want to mention either one of their names uh, so that they don't start up again. Uh, what were we talking about? We were talking about small businesses. Yes, I mean, small businesses struggle because of regulations, because of taxes, uh, the complexity of taxes. The more complex, the more you have to pay to accountants. Uh, regulations eat up a huge amount of money. All these things are fixed costs that a small business can't really afford. Big businesses can. The system as it exists today in the United States, without question, favors large businesses over small. Large businesses are more likely to get a bailout, more likely to get subsidies. They favor large businesses over small. And that is unbelievably Unbelievable, uh, unbelievably, uh, uh, you know, destructive to the U.S. economy, destructive to what makes the U.S. economy so vibrant and dynamic. And yet, as bad as things are, I keep saying this, it's pretty amazing that the U.S. economy is doing as well as it is, given how many bad things are going on. Michael, for $100. Thank you, Michael. Uh, a federal judge has ruled that the Biden administration like, uh, likely violated the First Amendment by censoring unfavorable views on social media, calling it Orwellian, and issued a preliminary injunction. Will the courts buy us more time um, than technological progress? There's no question that the courts on certain issues are probably going to buy us a lot of time. They, they, they've, they've robbed many, many women of time with a ruling against abortion. So uh, women have not bought time. Uh, women have been, have been uh, sacrificed on the altar of, uh, y you know, of the right. Uh, and, uh, and this court did it. But this court is also favorable towards certain aspects of economic liberty. And, and some, of the, some of the other courts are too. And we'll see what happens when this goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has been favorable to free speech for a few decades now, we got a lot of very positive free speech rulings from the Supreme Court. And the courts generally still uh, try, at least, to uphold the Constitution, at least reference the Constitution. And as such, yes, they are buying us time. And uh, that time bought is time for us to advocate for the proper ideas, time for us to try to, to, to move the world uh, in, a, in a sustainable pro-freedom direction and not case by case, once in a while, the court does this or that. And of course, every time the court does that, the legislature can probably find ways around it uh, by passing irrational laws. All right, Harper Campbell. Uh, is one of the reasons Asian countries have such a low crime and obesity problems because they have very strong shame cultures. Um, intense feelings of shame prevent individual acting out isn't reason better than shame, but shame is better than nihilism. Well, shame is probably better than nihilism, but I, you know, I don't know. Like, what is shame? Uh, if you steal something and get away with it, uh, how are people going to shame you? You feel guilty, so they have maybe strong guilt cultures in a sense that people feel guilty. But I think 
they generally have, you know, the, the positives and negatives to Asian cultures in this sense. For example, one of the negatives is they're rule followers. They are, uh, you know, they, they are law followers. So if the law says don't do X, they don't do X. Not because they have understanding, not, they have a, not because they really understand the morality of it, not because they have a greater respect for property rights. It's because, I don't think it's a shame, it's just, um, it, it's, a, it's like when I was, I, I think I told you this at the time, when I was in, last year when I was in Korea and Japan, uh, and this is um, September of last year, right? Everybody was wearing masks, indoors and outdoors, everybody. It wasn't even required, but uh, certainly not outdoors, but kind of the, the social rule was everybody should wear masks. So nobody wanted to look different. Not, nobody wanted to challenge the consensus, and therefore they didn't wear masks. So I think it's more collectivism and... Um, uh, and uh, Um, it's more collectivism. Uh, it's more this idea of um, uh, following the rules. Conformity. Conformity is the right word. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. I, you know, one of the re reasons uh, you have higher crime in the U.S. is that people have more ambition and, and find immoral ways to manifest that. They are less conformist. They'll do stuff even though it's, it's not acceptable to do. I think there's a bunch of different things like that um, that, that, cause, that that are part of our culture. That it's not individualism, but it's a kind of an individual, kind of a, a, a nonconformist, which is not individualistic. Nonconformist doesn't mean it's egoistic, but there's a nonconformist in America. There are no standards, and, and shame is part of that. Shame is part of it. You are shamed if you don't conform. But it's internalized. It's not external. So is that better than nihilism? Sure, but it's not good. It's very bad. All right. Um, Laboratory Earl says, it's good to see a show again. You mentioned that a soul is something that you have to build yourself. Can you elaborate on that further? Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's an excellent article by Ankar Gatte about this. Ayn Rand, of course, talks about this, but, but Ankar has a whole article about this in the Companion to Ayn Rand, the book that Alan Gotthelf and uh, Greg Salmieri edited. Um, the next little article that really goes into detail on this and what it really means. But in short, your soul is basically the product of the choices you have made. It is a product of the values that you pursue. And uh, those values are a consequence of a choice. right? You, the, cho the values that you've chosen. Now, it could be that you don't make those choices. You just accept the values that the society has given you. You, you just conform. You just meld in. You, you don't spend too much thinking. And then you don't really have a soul. It's just a mishmash of stuff in there. To really have a soul, I think a soul is an integrated, you know, an integrated um, set of values, an integrated set of choices that shape you and 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 by doing so it, it, it your your emotions and your reason and your thinking are in sync uh, you, you know one value builds on another they're not clashing they're not they're not in conflict um, all guided by reason and that's the process by which you build a soul you choose your values carefully you make sure they're not in conflict if they are in conflict, you resolve it by using reason. This helps over time shape your emotional state, which then again feeds into your values. And you're constantly thinking and you're constantly building and you're constantly shaping. And that's a person with a soul. I think most people out there don't have a soul in that sense because it's just a mishmash of stuff. 
and it's time still in conflict. This is why there's so much unhappiness. This is why, it, 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 you know, people people are, are miserable. This is this explains much of the kind of the, the problems that we see in the world. Is that people haven't taken responsibility, and this is the this is the deepest sense of personal responsibility. The deepest sense of personal responsibility is to you're responsible for your own soul. You're responsible for your own being, for you, for, for what you are and who you are. You're responsible for building a soul. I might have Ankar sometime come on and just, just talk about that essay and what it means because it's really profound and really important. Ian Mirkat says, as a consumer, I usually tolerate leftist cringe until it comes to Israel. Not going to lie, I miss their ice cream. I eat it whenever I'm in Israel as the local branch is owned by a different company. Yeah, it is now. I just don't eat their ice cream. Israel was one of the issues, but it wasn't the primary one for me. For me, it was all the anti-capitalist. I mean, explicitly, it wasn't just a throwaway here and a throwaway there, corporate social responsibility or, or some, some meaningless statement. No, it was constant, uns, you know, constant stream of propaganda coming out of Ben and Jerry's to, um, uh, to, undermine, to undermine capitalism um, everywhere. Right? James, from your view, which of the following no-income states are on the right path for growth uh, in the next decade? Besides Texas and Florida, the other states are Arkansas, Nevada, New Hampshire, South Dakota, Tennessee, Washington, and Wyoming. Are any states on your list? Are any states on your list to live besides California? Um, let's see. I mean, if you go from from the end, I mean, Washington might not have income tax, but, but it is uh, uh, strongly leftist. So in every other respect, it's leftist. Um, I don't know how it ranks in terms of uh, regulation. It also rains a lot in Washington. I mean, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't mind living in Seattle for three months a year, basically June, July, August or something like that. Maybe September, maybe four months a year, but that's, that's about it. Um, Tennessee... Seems like a nice place to live and suddenly on the right direction. Um, Wyoming is kind of the middle of nowhere and super cold in the winter. But, you know, relative sanity, I guess, in terms of, in terms of regulations and taxes. South Dakota, probably the same. But again, super cold and, and, and hard to live, very harsh. New Hampshire is probably a growing state. It, it's not far from Massachusetts where there's a lot going on. It's, um, uh, it, is a, uh, it has uh, low regulations. It has low taxes, as you've said. Nevada, you know, problem with Nevada is desert, hot in the winter, cold in the summer. Uh, sorry, hot in the summer, cold in the winter. Um, and, uh, but if you like the desert, an amazing place to live and you pay no taxes and relatively low regulations. Arkansas is an amazing place. Uh, 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 AK is Arkansas, right? Um, it's, um, I didn't know they didn't have taxes or income, state income taxes, but Arkansas is generally a good place to, uh, amazing place to live. It's got good weather. It's um, uh, booming. Northwest Arkansas is booming. Uh, very, very dynamic environment. Uh, oh, so, so AK is Alaska, so forget Arkansas. Alaska. I mean, no, Alaska's not going to grow. It's, it's, it's too cold. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, um, AK, yes, AR is Arkansas. So uh, Alaska's not going to grow fast. I mean, it's too cold. Uh, to hell with taxes. It's just too cold. How, how can you live there? So of those, probably the most habitable is Tennessee and New Hampshire. Um, but, but the others will attract population. People will move there because of the low taxes and the low regulations and, and, and the beautiful scenery of Wyoming and so on. So again, pluses and minuses. Are there any states on my list besides California? I don't know. Um, I can't live in the South, much of the South, not all of the South, much of the South. Um, I find it too Christian. Um, I find it too Christian and, and, and too... 
I don't know, too Christian, I guess is a good, good way of putting it. Um, and so New Hampshire's too cold, Nevada's too hot, maybe Tennessee would be on my list, Texas is on my list. Um, I mean, again, I, I, I wish I could live in, in Washington or even Oregon, beautiful, beautiful places, but too much rain. So, uh, you know, not many, not many lists. The Bible Belt is out. The only place in Texas I would probably live is, is, is Austin, maybe Dallas, um, if I had to, but I wouldn't live anywhere else. Uh, so, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, you know, the, the reality is California is, in terms of many things, among the best places in the world to live other than the regulation and the taxes. Shazbot, have you heard about the cocaine found in the White House? I have. It's not mine. I haven't been to the White House. No, I mean, nobody knows whose it is. They probably will never find out whose it is. I don't really care that much about whose it is. Um, you know, the culture in Washington, D.C. is, I, I, you know, do, do, do politicians and their aides and others in government do a lot of drugs? Probably. Recreational drugs? Probably. Certainly, there's a lot of drugs in Wall Street. There's a lot of drugs in Silicon Valley. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of drugs in, uh, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Is it Hunter Biden's? Maybe, but it could be. As I've told you, Hunter Biden's behavior on all fronts is not the exception. It, it tends to be the rule of, of in these kind of families and particularly in, in D.C. So it doesn't surprise me at all. It, it so would not surprise me that I didn't think it was newsworthy. Uh, Laboratory L, the opposition to the LB, LGBTQ WTF goes far beyond the right at this point with some of the old far left feminists being very vocal about it. This is an issue that even old school leftists agree is BS. Yes, I agree. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big supporter on this issue of uh, J.K. Rollins. I, I, I do think that um, there is a real issue here. I just think the right is irrationally nutty about it I, I they 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 go berserk about it and it's it, it seems like these days the only issue relating the only issue they really care about and uh, and that i think is bizarre and weird and uh but but yeah there's a real legitimate issue i'm, I'm not a fan of the nutty lgbtq plus whatever um uh, you know go uh, once you get uh, once you get um um you know what do you call it, uh, 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 gay marriage, you're mostly done. You're mostly done. And, and culturally, a culture where we don't discriminate against gays, uh, then you're mostly done with those issues. And, and you know, you don't want to treat people with, mel you know, with, with, with these problems, the, the various trans issues. You don't want to treat them badly. But that doesn't mean they have to be elevated on a pedestal and made the model for uh, humanity. It, there's something very abnormal about them and that needs to be recognized and and i think for many of them real psychological problems and that should not be normalized they, they need help i feel sorry for them more than anything else iron male cats uh hey iran do you support building a great big beautiful wall between the government and social media yes absolutely i'm a big wall guy i i love walls i i do believe in building walls just not on borders I'm a big supporter of a wall of separation between church and state, religion and state, ideas and state, education and state, social media and state, science and state, and we could go on, right? Those walls are beautiful walls, beautiful walls. And we can make them a digital wall. It doesn't have to be even a real wall. It'll be a lot cheaper. We won't have to spend a lot of government resources on it. Let's just make it a digital wall. Dave, thank you, Dave. It used to be people would read Ayn Rand and then discover your show. Now people are discovering your, you first and then exploring Ayn Rand's work. Keep up the consistency, it's working. Yeah, I think that's right. I met a lot of people, a lot of people at Ocon who told me they discovered objectivism because of my show. So, wow. I mean, I am excited by that, motivated by that. For all of the people who came up to me during Ocon and talked and described their path and and uh, thank you for coming up. Thank you for talking. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm rushed. Sometimes I seem distracted because there's so many things going on. But I just want to reassure all of you and, and really say thank you and that I really do enjoy those conversations, joy hearing from you. 
uh, and uh, and please don't stop letting me know, and please don't stop coming and saying thank you, or, or, or just saying hello at Ocon. Uh, Hiram, uh, believe it or not, almost every ethnicity on earth has had some kind of organized crime and their own nickname for it. No, no kidding. Italians and mafia's popular culture is mostly due to romanticism. Yeah, and, and even, you know, yes, and, and uh, it's, it's been kind of institutionalized into movies, right? And the particular movies that represent it. But there's certain ethnic groups that are associated with, um, with um, you know, more uh, organized crime than others. But whether that is a reality or not is dubious because, as you say, every country has its organized crime, every single one of them. All right, Jacob says hello from Norway. Hi, Jacob. Great to see you. We had a good contingency from Norway. We had an even, I think, bigger contingency from the Netherlands. It was a very international group. Mexico, Argentina, Brazil. Uh, it was very international group. So uh, Europeans, it, it was just a lot of Israelis, as always. Stephen says, I had a great time at Ocon. It was nice to meet you again. Absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Robert Naser, Naser, I, 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 I'm, I've been working on it. Uh, Ocon 2023 was epic. The talks were powerful and personal, personally applicable. Attendees and presenters were approachable, pleasant, fun. See you all in Anaheim. Yeah, let's go Anaheim. Roland said, unfortunately, I missed out on Ocon this year, but I'm already looking forward to next year's one. Hope to see you there. Liam says, Todd's funny, in his closing remarks at Ocon said, we're trying to create heaven on earth. Is this the right formulation, given that most uh, dystopian movement claims to bring about heaven on earth? Um, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's, you're right, in a sense. I wouldn't have used those terms, but it it's captures everybody in this, the context. He's capturing the context. The context is... Um, is that we're trying to trying to create this amazing place on earth. We're trying to bring moral perfection and, and the moral ideal to, to earth. Liam says, the interview with Yomni Yomni Park was amazing. Is she an objectivist? I don't think she's an objectivist. She's certainly sympathetic. She's read a lot, a lot uh, of Ayn Rand. Um, and uh, she was she was very good as always. Uh, I am working on having on the Iran Brook Show, so I, uh, I I got permission to email her and to try to coordinate an appearance on the Iran Brook Show. So I'm hoping to have her on in the next few weeks, months. Uh, but but yes, uh, Yomni Park is uh, is on my list of people uh, to uh, to bring on uh, for an interview. So that that'll be a lot of fun and I think it will be really interesting um, so uh, you can look forward to that all right Connor says uh, Kemi Badenoch yeah my favorite British politician uh, I, I thought um, as business secretary canceled the plans to remove all EU regulations she defended the move by saying I'm not I'm a conservative not an arsonist so much for being the next Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, it's sad. Remember, Margaret Thatcher got rid of very few regulations. Reality. Um, uh, I mean, she did privatize a bunch of stuff. She did do some regulatory vote. But look, um, the, the thing is not to get rid of all EU regulations all at once. And this, it was a stupid promise to begin with. What Kemi and what the conservatives should do is have a plan. A, 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 a three-year plan, a four-year plan, a two-year plan, whatever. Here are the regulations, and here the how are we going to get rid of them? And and and, uh, and and so everybody knows, the businesses knows, individuals knows. We need a transition, but we need it explicit and we need it fast. And that's what they claim they're going to put together, but you know, yeah. I mean, I'm saddened, but the reality of politics in England is such that even if you are the next Margaret Thatcher. You probably can't win and you probably can't get the stuff that you want to get done, done. Hopper Campbell, in a free society, if someone doesn't voluntarily pay their taxes, could he be denied a public defender if he goes to court? Yes, I mean, there are a lot of things that can be done. 
could be denied a public defender. If they decide if there's going to be public defenders in a in a laissez faire country, I'm not sure they would be. But if they are, um, you know, he could be denied the vote. You know, voting is not, you know, I don't think an essential. You know, you might have to pay your taxes for four years, pay into the government for four years to be able to vote. I don't think that would be a violation of rights. Um, James Taylor says Miami is humid and gross, but the infrastructure in Floridian cities is so much better than California. No, it's not. I mean, maybe the roads, but even the roads are terrible. God, Miami, Miami roads and, and, uh, and traffic jams and all of that are unbelievable in Southern Florida. I don't know in what part, what part of the infrastructure is better in Florida than California. Maybe it is. I'm not saying it is. I just don't know where and, and how. I never had, other than the lack of roads, never had, and traffic jams, never had much of a problem with California infrastructure. Andrew, adversity scores show how ideas trump the law. That's right. Egalitarianism and altruism will always find their way until, they det uh, until they, they will, you know, we determine them as evil, as wrong, as morally wrong. The Godfather says, besides open versus closed systems, what are other ongoing debates going on within objective circles? There is no debate going on about open and closed. There is no debate. There, there are people who advocate for a dishonest position. That's not a debate. That's why I wouldn't have debated it. I don't think it's worth debating. I mean, there are lots of philosophical discussions. Uh, you know, and the, the, the split with Kelly, for example, is not over open or closed. The split was open fact versus value. But there are many, uh, you know, how to understand Ayn Rand on a particular epistemological point. There, there are dozens and dozens of, of different discussions and debates going on about uh, different points about the philosophy itself and then about how to apply it. Uh, could AI create an objectivism cable channel? I mean, why? Who would watch it? Objectivists? I mean, we need to have lots and lots of podcasts. That's the modern way to do it, not, not to do conventional TV. We don't have enough of an audience. When I have 5 million, uh, 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 you know, subscribers, then we can talk about it. Uh, Clark says, is left versus right socialism versus fascism, or really it's fascism versus fascism? Well, it's, it's, it's two different things. I think socialism versus fascism is not bad, uh, but in a sense, it's, fascism is a form of socialism. Um, you know, they have also different manifestations in they control over our bedrooms, over our, our, our lives, our social lives, not just over the economy. I mean, both are forms of collectivism. So left and right today are both forms of collectivism. How you label them depending, depends on a specific context, the specific, uh, you know, specific issues that a particular leftist or particular right wing raises. By the way, we're one dollar short of the six hundred fifty dollar goal. Pretty amazing, uh, Johannes. I'm trying to grasp Rand's immor oh, immortal robot example. If I was immortal, I'd imagine valuing pleasure, hedonism, and uh, curiosity, even though life is not the standard of value anymore. What am I missing? Well, but there is no value to pleasure um, outside of an evolutionary context in which pleasure is aimed towards life. That is, pleasure develops in order to encourage you to do the things that are pro-life, for the most part, right? Nature sometimes fool you. So once the pleasure mechanism, once uh, life is, is no longer the standard biologically, that is, you can't die. You're literally immortal. You can't die. You can't kill yourself. You can't, you can't be shot. You, can't, it's not just, you just can't die. Then uh, that mechanism is unnecessary. And therefore, that mechanism evolutionarily goes away. So there is no meaning to pleasure outside of the idea, um, outside of the idea of, uh, of um, life as the standard. There's no purpose. So hedonism would be for what? You're enjoying something, but why are you enjoying it? Right? Biologically, I don't think you, were, you would enjoy it. Um, yeah, and uh, curiosity even more. Why be curious? What's the purpose of curiosity? What for? What would be, what would be the, 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 
the, the value gained by learning something new if your life is not the standard. Thank you to those of you who are putting in a dollar. We got four of you uh, to get us over the top. Uh, thanks. Andrew uh, says, do you find LGBTQ issues once taboo, now boring? Um, prior chat, I'm not sure made it, was that adversity scores... Yeah, I got that. I got the prior chat. Um, I don't find it boring. I mean, some of them I think are challenging. I think how to deal with trans issue is challenging because there is, for some people, a biological element. There's certainly psychological elements. And, and I do think it's challenging. I, what I find is, is the, and I've talked about this and I will talk more about this in the future, I find the right's obsession around it revealing. It's, it, they found a hook where they're anti-pleasure, anti-life, anti-sex, uh, authoritarianism manifests itself. And... Um, I find that very revealing of the right and, and important to point out on the right so people know. I mean, there is going to be an issue one day, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, where, where you'll be able to change your sex without, um, when we have a fuller understanding of all these things, without, you know, any kind of bizarre surgery, or without, and, and where things will be a lot more I mean, as I said, you, you, can, you can create a, a human embryo with no man and no woman involved. You can create it from a skin cell. So there are going to be some interesting issues as we move forward, right, about these kind of things. And I, I, I certainly think the right, you know, would like to kill that science and like to kill that progress because they can't handle it because of their Puritan kind of mentality. But, you know, that's way in the future. It's not relevant today. And, 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 and I think generally we live in a super prudish society about sex and about a lot of things. And I think that gets manifested in a lot of these, a lot of these attitudes, particularly on the right. And, and the left has this nihilism going. And, and that's what you see in terms of their attitude towards LGBTQ. And there's really no rational position with regard to, uh, to LGBTQ issues. Uh, the Godfather says, I know you don't like anime, but you love art. There is a new anime, Vampire in the Garden, uh, that is about how art is a driver and mechanism to freedom. Thought you would give it a chance. I I'll, I'll look it up, Vampire in the Garden. Uh, Michael says, why do you think Hispanics in America are only rich in Miami and poor in every other major city? Well, that's not true. None of that is true. I, I mean, they're rich Hispanics everywhere. They're, they're super rich Hispanics in Texas. They're super rich Hispanics in California. Everywhere where Hispanics have basically been there for a while and built up capital, they tend to be rich. They're very rich Hispanic families all over the United States. Uh, there are Hispanic individuals who are lawyers and doctors and entrepreneurs and uh, and CEOs and uh, you know it's completely bizarre. Public a, a number of publicly traded companies are run by Hispanic CEOs. So it's 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 silly to to categorize things like that. Uh, I mean they're more wealthy in Miami because. In Miami, a lot of the Hispanics there are the wealthy of Latin America. They live part-time in Miami and part-time in whatever other country they are in. And Miami is their escape valve. Miami is the place where they can escape to. But that is not to diminish the fact that there are super rich uh, Hispanics everywhere in, uh, in the country. Is there any chance you could, uh, Jeff says, is there any chance you could cover the current Canadian news story sometime about the confrontation between Trudeau and Google, Twitter and Facebook and fallout from Bill C-18 passing. I mean, I covered it a little bit on one show with regard to Facebook. I will, I will check it out. I, I, I don't get kind of Canada doesn't jump out in my news feed, but I can certainly take a look at it and, uh, and, and see. But the, I know Facebook, there was a real consequence of the Facebook, uh, but I don't know about the others. Michael says, uh, we think of the Holocaust as an un 
equally evil event, but the Dark Ages were thousand plus years of constant Holocaust. The Nazis were an attempt to return man to the constant state of slaughter. Well, that's not how the Nazis viewed it. They just want to get rid of certain people so that they can manifest themselves uh, as positives. And, and, and while well, the Dark Ages involved slaughter, it wasn't organized, mechanized, and, and, and the, the intent was not slaughter. Um, uh, you know, there were wars and people killed each other and there were a lot of wars and there was a lot of killing and there was a lot of murder and there was a lot of crime. But, um, but there wasn't this industrialization of murder and the murder, the wiping out of a whole people. There were some pogroms on the Jews, but, but the scale of, of the Holocaust is unique and the intent of the Holocaust, I think, is very much unique. There have been ethnic cleansing in the past. There has been the slaughter of a particular ethnic group in the past. Um, I don't know that the Dark Ages are particularly a place where that happened more than others. Uh, Daniel says, Mark Andreessen was on Sam Harris' podcast. Great episode. Can Mark be forgiven for his sins? Maybe, maybe. Yes, I mean, in this environment, yes, because we need all the voices we can to talk about AI. Midwest, the thoughts on child predators and the death penalty. You know, I'm generally favor the death penalty when there is unequivocal, um, uh, when it's unequivocal, it's beyond, just beyond a reasonable doubt. It's beyond any doubt. Uh, and um, that includes child predators, that includes uh, that inc murderers, uh, it, it includes quite a bit, but it, it really, it really, the focus, um, um, uh, you know, it really has to be that you, you don't, you're not killing people who might be innocent. And, and we saw with DNA testing how many people in death row actually are innocent. So uh, child predators is one of the worst offenses possible. Yeah, I, I have no problem with the death penalty for certain people who do this, uh, who, who, who are child predators. Uh, Apollo Zeus, uh, you at the gym in Miami, what did you do? I basically had Tom from UK, who's a physical therapist and a trainer, you know, just just try to, you know, push me and push me and push me to my limit. He's great. Um, if you need a personal trainer, you should use him. He also does it by Zoom um, and uh, worked on strength, uh, both upper body, lower body strength. Uh, lifted weights, used the machines, uh, did a lot of that. All right. Thank you, everybody. We, we reached our 650 goal, which is terrific. Uh, there will be a show tomorrow at 3 p.m. East Coast time. And then next week, we'll get back on our normal schedule, Monday, Monday through Friday, uh, around 1 p.m. East Coast time, uh, a news briefing, and then, uh, and then uh, Tuesdays and Thursday in the evening, uh, our usual um, a usual show, and uh, I can't remember if next Thursday I have an interview, but probably um, we're, we're trying to get back on schedule in terms of interview, and I also have a show. Actually, I got a show, uh, a show sponsorship from Alex Epstein, so um, uh, I will be doing a show uh, that he asked me to do on a topic he asked that'll probably be Tuesday. Oh, yes, I'm looking forward to this. On Thursday, uh, the 13th, I will be interviewing Jim Lennox. Jim Lennox is a philosopher of science from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, been involved in objectives of a very long time. He is, I, I think he's emeritus, I think he's retired, but he's an expert on evolution in Darwin, and I want to talk to him about evolution, evolutionary psychology, um, and, and topics like that. So I think that one, wow, I would definitely listen to that one. I'm really looking forward to that, because it's like, here's a world-class expert on something that I have a vague notion of what my critique of it is. And then, of course, evolution and Darwin, amazing uh, to have somebody who can really talk about that from a fully scientific slash philosophical perspective. So I'm looking forward to that. So those are the shows next week. I'll do the Alex Epstein one on Tuesday and Jim Lennox on Thursday. Alex is not on the show. He's just asked me to cover a particular topic relating to environmentalism that I will cover, I think he's using it to kind of get, get thinking about certain topics and get some ideas about it. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow at 3 p.m. Have a great weekend. Have a great rest of your Friday.